Hello, my name is Alan Leinwand. I'm SVP Engineering at Slack. My pronouns are he and him. I'm really excited to be talking today about balancing fast-paced innovation and technical debt. It's one of my favorite topics. Greetings from San Francisco. Let's go ahead and get started. Many of you probably know Slack. Slack is the collaboration hub that moves work forward. You've probably seen this on your desktop or on your mobile phone. It's an application that's used to drive collaboration along the work, among the workspaces and among people at work. In Slack, we have something called channels and channels power network teams. You organize communication around teams or projects or topics because channels are transparent, people make faster decisions, you have fewer meetings, and you have the seamless collaboration both inside your company and outside. Slack integrates with over 2,300 tools that development teams and other teams use. Development tools like GitHub, New Relic, PagerDuty. You'll see things like Jira integrations, Jenkins integrations, integrations to things like AWS and GCP. We have lots and lots of integrations and lots and lots of tools that work with our product, and that makes our product very innovative. Here at Slack, we have 130,000 paid customers. Slack's used in over 150 countries and it's also used by 65 of the Fortune 100 customers. So those are some business stats, but let me give you some engineering stats since I work in engineering. At its peak messages per minute, Slack sends about 150 million peak messages per minute. We have about 14 billion HTTP requests we send per day. We have 65 billion database queries per day. We store about nine petabytes of database storage we have 13 million active sessions at a given point during the day using Slack. There's 5 billion background jobs and over 2 trillion metrics we collect. Slack operates at great scale. And that's important because engineers who want to work in fast-paced innovation want to work at scale. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The team at Slack, we have engineering teams around the globe. We have teams in Melbourne, Australia, Pune, India, Dublin, Ireland, New York City, Toronto, Denver, San Francisco, and Vancouver. Our engineering teams are global. Our engineering teams drive fast innovation across the globe. But let me talk a little bit about some things that I've learned about what engineers want. And then throughout this presentation, I'm gonna talk about what I think engineers have want and how we actually balance technical debt with fast-paced innovation. There's some tips and trade along the way that I've learned throughout my career. So what do, best, what do the best engineers want? The first thing I think they want is they really want to be innovative. They want to drive their business forward. Engineers want to work on technology. They want to work on product. They want to work on software that moves the business forward. The second thing that engineers want is they want to work at scale. And scale might be number of users, number of endpoints, number of systems, uh, a scale in terms of complexity of algorithm, a scale in terms of quality, but generally people want to work at something that has a scale that is interesting and challenging for them. And lastly, engineers want to work on a great team, a team that's got a purpose, a team where they know their part, a team where they have some autonomy to do the work as part of that team. And when that work is all done, they want visibility for it. So if you think about what engineers are looking for in a fast paced, innovative environment, it's driving the business forward, operating and working at scale, and then being part of a great team that allows them to deliver success for those other two portions of the business. So when you think about it, engineers want team, they want to innovate and they want scale, but there's a lot more that comes with being part of this environment. You have customers that have product and feature requests, you have bugs, you have incidents, you have test frameworks you've got to work on. You've got to work on things like accessibility. You have process with inside the company. You've got your development environment. You've got quality testing tools. And all these things eventually end up putting an enormous burden on those engineers. The engineers want a great team. They want to be innovative and they want to work at scale. But everything else that comes around it ends up building up becoming this sludge that becomes part of the technical debt. So how do you balance that? How do you balance the needs of 
the engineering team to be innovative, to work at scale on a great team with sort of the takes of incidents from customers, bugs that are coming in and things that just are on the backlog from product or other issues that you have to deal with. How do you figure out that right balance in order to think through being successful and continuing the innovation? So again, these are some, some tips and trade along the way, tips and uh, ideas that I've learned along the way that I think are very, very useful. So we have this saying at Slack and it's something that I've brought with me to the company about what are engineering priorities. So what I say engineering teams should be doing every single day immediately when they wake up is thinking about things in this order. Number one, we should be fixing customer issues fast. This isn't about everything in the backlog. This isn't about fixing every minute little corner case bug. This is about fixing the things that cause customer pain, be critical or high, severity one, severity two, whatever classification you call it. The next thing that engineers need to do is they need to figure out how to make sure those customer issues that cause that pain don't happen again. This is a critical part. This is absolutely essential to do to make sure that you can do step three, which is build an innovative product. What's interesting about engineering teams is everyone wants to build innovation. Everyone wants to go fast. Everyone wanna works on the product features and the innovation for the business. But if you don't do number, number, number one and number two properly, you get stuck and you end up with this massive tech debt and massive backlog. Matter of fact, what generally happens is that engineering priorities operate in the wrong way at many times. Engineers build an innovative product. This is what they wake up in the morning. What's on my backlog? What are my stories? What are my epics? What are the things I gotta be building right now for product? And they wake up working on innovative product all the time, product, product. Then when customer issues occur, that's an interrupt. It gets them out of the flow. We have to go fix those customer issues. And generally engineering teams are great about swarming around engineering customer problems. So we'll be building our product, we'll see an issue, it reaches that critical area where we have to address it. We'll go in and fix the customer issues fast. But then what generally happens immediately afterwards is we go right back to building product. Teams often forget the step where to make sure those issues and those problems don't happen again. And if you build product, jump to a customer issue, go back to building product, back to the customer issue, what you'll find is a tech debt builds up and issues continue to repeat themselves because you didn't make time to go make sure they didn't happen again. And that's where you end up with this imbalance between technical debt becoming a burden, becoming something that's weighing down the team and the velocity that everyone wants in the business to build that innovative product. Now, issues are gonna happen. So what I like to tell people is when customer issues happen, when things break, when humans make mistakes, because we all have gray matter and therefore we're all faulty and we're all gonna make mistakes, but issues will happen. What you do next is what counts. And what I mean by that is I mean to figure out how to address the issue to make sure they don't happen again. And my answer there is similarly to what we've just talked about, follow the priorities. When something breaks, fix that customer issue. Have teams run to that fire, do that swarming. Make sure that the engineering team really understands the customer issue. Listen to the customer and provide the solution they need and fix those issues fast. Number two, make sure they don't happen again. And the way you do this is you come up with a list of remediation items that actually from that customer issue or that incident, you prioritize them and you set SLAs on them. And you say, we are gonna get these done in this order because if we don't get them done in this order, they're just potholes. They're just things that are gonna go wrong again. We've all been there. We've all been trying to work on something. We put the, remediation item that makes sure it won't happen again over to the side. I'll, I'll work on that later. Uh, I've got to get something else done. And then it blows up again. So we always say, make sure they don't happen again as the second priority. And that means fix any broken processes, make sure you repair the bugs and get them off the backlog 
And in the world of cloud, when you're running a 24 by seven operation, you're looking for what's called monitoring misses. These are, these are situations where the customer heard about the problem and the customer found the issue before engineering or before the internal operations team did. So make sure that when you're making sure things don't happen again, you pursue the remediation items, you make sure you find the broken processes, the bugs that need to get fixed in any monitoring areas you have as well. And what's amazing about this is if you do this, if you get really good at fixing customer issues fast and making sure they don't happen again, if that cycle spins super quick, amazing things happen. Interrupts go down because that backlog item you put over to the side won't bite you again. Engineers have more time to stay in the flow. Customers are happier and you have more time to build that innovative product that everyone wants to do. But again, a lot of teams think about it in the reverse order. They build the innovative product. That's what they wake up thinking about. They'll swarm to the customer issue and then they'll completely skip step number two. So it's something you have to prioritize doing things in this order. Now, this is not something you're gonna put up in front of your teams and within a day, everyone's gonna start doing this. This takes time. This takes a cultural change. It takes repetition and it takes effort. Here at Slack, I send out a monthly message to some channels that we have within the company. And at the top of that message, which is a general engineering update, I always list the priorities. I want everyone to know about it. I want everyone to see that it's important for our culture. I want new hires that are coming in because we're constantly bringing a new talent to the company to understand how we do things at Slack, where we fix the customer issues, we do our best to burn down the backlog within SLA to make sure that don't happen again, and then we have lots of time to build innovative product. So let's talk about how you actually drive that innovation. So how do you get that innovation wheel faster? How do you get things going? One of the metrics we use at Slack is called cycle time. And cycle time is the total wall clock time from the start of a story or an epic or a product feature when someone actually writes it down somewhere until the time that feature is deployed to all customers. Now in certain organizations, that might be a long time. It might be months, it might be years. In other organizations, it might be you know, a day, hours, weeks. But what's interesting about that metric is if you start to look at it, it breaks down into various components. One of the components is actually writing that epic or story. Another is doing the software development. The third is building and testing and making sure that occurs. Merging that piece of code and that software into something that's ready to be deployed and then actually deploying it. And you start to think about each of those steps and how could you actually optimize each of those steps to drive this cycle time down? Remember every minute, every day, every hour, you reduce cycle time, it's faster innovation. It increases the pace of the innovation. So you can make epics and stories easier to write. You can have templates. So those get done into the system faster. On the development side, you can have development environments that get built faster. We have development environments in flight for our engineers ready to go with the click of a button. We pre-bake IDEs, we set up debuggers for them. We don't have people spending time just getting their development environment up and going. On the build and test side, whether you're building on mobile, Android, iOS, whether you're building on Linux, whether you're building on Mac OS or Windows, there's different build systems. Look at the time each of those takes to compile and build. Look at the time each of the different test environments takes to spin up and run the integration tests, run the functional tests, run the unit tests. Can those times be decreased? Can you reduce that overall time? Engineers sitting around waiting for builds and tests are engineers that are not developing and moving innovation forward. Can you increase, sorry, decrease your merge times? Can you increase the speed of merges as those merges go through GitHub or whatever other tool you're using? Um, can you actually then deploy faster? Here at Slack, we have various types of deployment mechanisms we use, a blue-green deployment, a percentage-based rollout, a rollout to beta customers first and then off to production. But for each of those different steps, can you reduce that even by minutes or hours? Every single time you do that, you make cycle time go faster, you increase the pace of innovation. I'll give you just a, a quick example. At Slack, we looked at every element of cycle time. 
And we found certain teams uh, were taking a very long time to do code review. So that's part of the development circle here, the development iteration cycle. Some of our scrum teams, we have 70 something teams. Some of those scrum teams were doing code reviews in less than six hours on average. Other teams were doing code reviews in 24 to 40 hours. Which team do you think was going faster? It was a team that was getting the code reviews done, letting their teammates move forward, letting them move on to the next step of that development cycle. So just looking at every step along the way on cycle time speeds up that innovation pace, allows your teams to keep moving forward, and also produces more product. So engineering priorities, fix the customer issues fast, make sure they don't happen again, build an innovative product by reducing cycle time. If you do things in that order, you're gonna have a very happy engineering team that's both balancing tech debt and fast-paced innovation. So yes, you can have innovation on your team. You can have people operating at scale. You can have a team that knows their purpose, their part, that works together, that has visibility and autonomy. And yes, you're gonna have incidents. You're gonna have customer issues. You're gonna have bugs and you're gonna have backlog. But you wanna tip the balance so that way you can drive more innovation while still maintaining things that generally lead to tech debt. Being able to tip that balance a little bit, amazing productivity games for the company, amazing productivity games for the engineering teams, and just really moves everyone forward faster. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Again, my name is Alan Leinwand, and here's how to reach me. Thanks for your time, and I hope this was interesting and useful. Bye-bye. So we welcome you, Alan. How are you? Thanks. Nice to be here. Nice meeting you. Well, we have uh, some questions for you right now. Um, of course. The first question that we have here is, um, how do you collect cycle time info? How do you collect human effort time in? Yeah, that's, that's one of the trickier parts is to be able to figure out the various components of cycle time. So here at Slack, we use very discrete time periods to for each of the cycles. For, for example, when the story or the epic first gets written in JIRA, that becomes the start of the overall cycle time. We also measure things like compile time, integration time, build time, time to run the tests. We also measure time to deploys, depending on how the deployment mechanism is in terms of um, we do sort of a percentage-based rollout, so hitting 1%, 10% throughout the farm. And then when the actual feature and epic or story is fully in production, that ends the cycle. So we look at each of the steps of cycle time, and we spend time and effort to measure each of those steps, because every time you reduce each of those steps, you bring innovation faster. So I guess there isn't a simple answer of like, you just implement this one piece of code and you get cycle time but it's about understanding every step from the first time the epic of the story is written all the way through the code actually being in production. Okay, I am very sorry that we have so little time, but we have to go with the next speaker. I'm reminding people that they can ask you questions in Discord, Slack, or in Swapcard. Um, and we thank you very much for participating in this conference. We are so grateful to have you here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye.